Hello, everyone. Welcome. Come on in. We're just going to give everybody a little bit to uh, fill up the room, and then we'll get going with today's Fitzgerald Summer School session. Hello, Heidi. We have Elizabeth from France is with us already. Great. Just come on in and make yourselves comfortable. We'll give it about another minute for people to get situated. Philip is with us again. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and get going because I know we have a lot of uh, a lot of points to make. So, please welcome to Fitzgerald Summer School Session Four. This is uh, the non-Gatsby works, although we're going to talk a little bit about Gatsby as well. But mostly, we're going to focus on the beautiful and damned, tender is the night, and maybe one or two short stories. Before we get going, I did want to remind folks that thanks to the University of South Carolina, uh, anybody who is watching can, um, can get a discount on your book purchases. Doesn't have to be Fitzgerald books, basically anything on the South Carolina list. They are offering us a sale 40% off. All you need is this code JFITS21. Not sure who J stands for, but uh, it's a great opportunity to stock up on your Brooklyn or any other books that you may be missing. So I am going to stop the share right here. And uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Kirk Kernut and I'm the executive director. And it's great, my great pleasure to turn on the Zoom and then turn off my camera and listen. So at this point, uh, the only other announcement I wanna make and I'll make it at the end too, is that uh, we will have our fifth session will be on Sunday, June 27th at 4 p.m. Eastern time. And that is going to be a session on teaching the Great Gatsby in high schools. So that should be a very um, interesting conversation to have. Uh, and we hope you will tune in for that as well. Uh, so on that note, I am going to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. William Blachick, who is a reader in American literature at the uh, Liver Liverpool Hope University, and that is Liverpool, England. So if you ever find yourself in England and are interested in seeing Eleanor Rigby's gravesite, he lives right around the corner from that and is very happy to take you over there, as long as you don't sing to him. Uh, but Bill is the co-editor of this wonderful volume, 21st Century Readings of Tender as the Night, co-edited this book with Laura Rattray, and uh, he is the co-editor of a forthcoming volume, uh, along with a couple of us, uh, on uh, new essays on The Beautiful and Damned, which should be out, will be out from LSU Press next year uh, in time for us to celebrate the 100th anniversary of that novel. So on that note, Bill, I am going to turn things over to you and 
Uh, if anybody has questions, just go ahead and feed them either into the chat or the Q&A. I think we will do questions more toward the end this time, if that's all right, because I know the speakers have very specific points that they want to make. So, Bill, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Kirk. And uh, for members of the F. Scott Fitzgerald Society, those Beatles tours in Liverpool are free. Just thought you'd like to know that. Uh, welcome everybody from different time zones. Uh, we have a morning and afternoon in America and in Europe here it's early evening and I hope we'll have a few people from uh, Asia uh, still awake and been in what part of the which side of the uh, international time zone dateline you're on. Uh, so we gather today for the second session on race in Fitzgerald and um, we, we come together, we gather together not to praise or bury Fitzgerald, but to try to explore some of the key issues and depictions of race in his work and perhaps his life too. Um, I was reminded of something Kirk wrote uh, in a review in the F. Scott Fitzgerald View not too long ago uh, about the 1947 article by Milton Hindus uh, about anti-Semitism in Fitzgerald. So we have been talking about this for, for some time. Interestingly, that's, that's the same year as the film Gentleman's Agreement, the Ilya Kazan film uh, was, was featured in 1947. And I remember a scene in that, that film where um, I think it's the actor Deborah McGuire uh, is talking to Gregory Peck's son, who has just been uh, slandered for being, well, his father is pretending to be Jewish uh, as a news, in news, to write a newspaper article. Uh, and she says to him, it's okay, you're not actually Jewish. And that becomes a, a really center of the film that um, she's basically saying that, you know, white is the you know, racial gold standard. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that we want to think about to, today, really, about the the nature of, of whiteness in, in both Beautiful and Damned and in Andrews Night and I hope some other short stories, some short stories too. Uh, but we, we thought we'd follow up a little bit with the, the first session we had on race uh, last, last weekend where we had Arnold Rampersad and Michael Nolan uh, talking especially about the great Gatsby and um, there was a little correspondence we had uh, as a group uh, through emails and um, I'd like to start with Meredith and Kat here to follow up a little bit, some, some thoughts, some afterthoughts, and uh, some reactions to that, that discussion. So Meredith, you want to start us off? Sure, sure. Um, first, thank you. And I wanted to thank Kat for inspiring me to put Zelda's painting uh, behind me today. Um, so first of all, I wanted to say, I thought the dialogue between um, Arnold Rompersad and Michael Nallen was great. Thank you for setting it up. Um, and I thought it was sort of a perfect example of, of teaching the conflicts around a text, you know, and getting students to think about those different positions. And I think what, what really struck me, you know, is I, I, think, I think about Fitzgerald as enga engaging in a kind of common intellectual pro pro project with some of those Harlem Renaissance thinkers, like what is identity? What is race? You know, what is the nature of whiteness and white supremacy? And that's sort of how I understood Ron Prasad's argument about the subversive nature of Gatsby, that it's just an effort to really kind of like analyze white supremacy. How, how do these people maintain their power, you know, um, in what ways? So that was a really powerful um, aspect of, of um, Arnold's argument for me. And I think the other moment that I just really loved was when, um, Robert Saad said, you know, it's perfectly possible to hate black people and white people at the same time. Um, and I think that that's an important thing to keep in mind um, when we're talking about an author's, you know, racial or, you know, you know, anti-Semitic um, positions, positions around identity. And it's something that comes up when I teach Wharton too, like, the, is it possible to be an equal opportunity misanthrope, you know, or pessimist about the human condition? And I think that it is. Um, so those were just a couple moments that I really took home. And I wanted to mention one thing that I, I may not have heard because I, I tuned in a few minutes late. I think the role of the eyewitness in Gatsby is an important one. 
um, to consider. Um, and in some ways, like when Michael Nallen was talking about, you know, the, the black men on the bridge, you know, whom Carraway sees, I also wanted to get the, the eyewitness into the conversation as well, um, because I think it's very significant, you know, that we have this character, you know, who Fitzgerald descri describes as a pale, well-dressed Negro identifying the car, you know, um, and he says it in this very fragmentary way. Um, and uh, again, it isn't something that the text pays a, a lot of attention to. Um, but I think when you're looking at those representations that seem sort of stereotypically racist or whatever, you wanna think about the kind of counterbalance that's there as well. And I think the fact that Fitzgerald places that there is very significant. And I think what I love about Gatsby is that it's impossible to write off any argument. You know, you can't write off the argument about the racist tropes because they're definitely there. Um, but you can't write, ar write off the arguments about the critique, you know, of racism and the critique of white supremacy because that's also definitely there. Um, so I love the way that the novel just kind of makes you keep reconsidering. And I think that that's what's particularly rich about it um, for teaching and scholarship. So those were just a few comments that I wanted to start with. Great. And um, I'm going to turn over to Catherine Kaiser in a moment, but I, I think we were, we were chatting so friendly before the actual webinar started that, um, yeah, you, you, those of you in, in the worldwide audience who might like to know that was uh, Professor Meredith Goldsmith speaking just now from uh, um, Ursinus College. Uh, and uh, Meredith was um, one, of, one of the, f I think, for, for, well, you must have written this when you were a teenager in 2003, uh, the article, uh, White Skin and, and White Masks, a uh, really seminal essay on ideas of race, especially in Gatsby. Um, I'm turning over to, to Catherine Kaiser now. Uh, Kat uh, is a, a, a professor and McCausland fellow at the University of South Carolina and um, the only person I think on the panel that I've not had the pleasure of uh, reading uh, work in manuscripts before and helping to edit their work. Um, but the work uh, that I'm thinking of is the Artificial Color uh, book from Oxford University Press in 2009. Um, um, a subtitle, Modern Food and uh, Racial Fictions. Uh, and uh, we, we have a particular chapter on Tenders and I Tend um, Save Me the Waltz uh, from Catherine's book. So um, Catherine, I'll introduce others as we, start, as we go to speak, but uh, Catherine, do you wanna say a few more things about the um, reactions to that first seminar? Sure, thank you, Bill. Um, and Artificial Color is from 2019, so still brand new, which makes it even more of a delight to be talking with such a fabulous group of panelists about race and Fitzgerald and getting these ideas out there. And I would echo everything that Meredith said. I loved Dr. Rampersad's point about the whited sepulcher. And I do think that one of the pieces of anti-racist work that the great Gatsby does is to make whiteness that default universalized symbol in a white supremacist society to make that visible and also to make it inextricable from class and to show how it plays out in questions of gender and questions of sexuality. So this is one of my favorite things about reading and teaching Fitzgerald is that all of these categories are so intimately connected in these struggles over power. And a lot of his most profound lyrical flights actually are about the impossibility of embodying the fantasy of whiteness as a fantasy of purity, as something that no human being in a mortal body could ever be. And the other point I really wanted to draw out of Sunday's discussion for our webinar today is Dr. Nellen's point that Toni Morrison's playing in the dark really gives us a great idiom for understanding how Fitzgerald is um, playing with these racial dynamics and struggling with them as well. I think this ambivalence was very much the ambivalence of the authors. And something that I see in his work uh, that comes up in my arguments about him are that he often uses 
one racialized group in order to think of another racialized group. So Meredith brings up the light-skinned Negro eyewitness. And of course, this is gonna be the unraveling of Gatsby's passing. Whether you see his passing as one of class or ethnicity, a parvenu or an Eastern European or Jewish American becoming white. Um, to think through one identity with another identity is classic Fitzgerald in my view. He frequently, instead of writing directly on the nose about Irishness, instead writes anxiously about Jewishness and about anti-Semitism because both of these groups seemed only provisionally white. And I think that Fitzgerald had intimations of uh, the artificiality of that, to use a word I lean on a lot in my book. But also, I think he had a lot of uh, anxiety and fear, this kind of anti-Semitism that he had internalized, this sort of anti-Irish sentiment that he had internalized. And a lot of his fiction walks that dividing line. Right. Right. Well, and and I think that notion of the intersectionality too is really key because it, it, those tropes come in, don't they? We have race and, and we have a gender and sexuality uh, as well as class. They, they, the way that he describes them, they do come together in so many ways, as you've illustrated really well, uh, you know, superbly well in your book. Um, I heard some uh, noises in the background too, so time for me to introduce also Deborah uh, Schlacks uh, from the um, well, Press Emeritus now. I hope that's to let you on the campus at the University of Wisconsin Superior. Uh, and also uh, David Ulrich, uh, professor of English at Birmingham Southern College and um, co-editor uh, with Kirk and myself of that uh, new collection of essays on, on the beautiful and damned. And Meredith has contributed an important chapter, which we'll get to in a little, little bit here too. And, um, and both of you have written on different um, aspects of uh, different novels in Fitzgerald and issues about uh, race and otherness, certainly. Um, uh, I don't know if uh, we're going to turn to to Deborah in a little bit about aspects of Irishness, I think. But David, do you want to pitch in anything else about the uh, response to that first? Show? Sure. Um I'd be happy to. First of all, um, I think that um, the, both Meredith and Kat bring up important things. Um, you know, the eyewitness is very interesting because it's um, uh, Michaelis, uh, a Greek, um, who is, is one of the eyewitnesses as well. So, I mean, he's, you know, from Mediterranean descent. Um, he's not going to be allowed in the, in the country after 1924 immigration laws or, you know, very, very few Greeks. Um, and then also, I think Kat's comment about how Fitzgerald looks at uh, one ethnicity through another ethnicity is absolutely spot on. Um, I, I, it makes, that makes a lot of sense to me. I hadn't thought of it quite in those terms before. Uh, my comments, I have two of them, I think, in particular about um, last Sunday's um, uh, session. One of them has to do with the last question um, in terms, and, and this may look forward to um, teaching Gadsden in high school. Um, you know, the idea that people are going to just simply categorically say, I won't read this text because of its um, portrayal of, of, of the Jewish people and African Americans. And I think this is easily solvable um, in terms of how one constructs one's syllabus. Um, how one introduces the text by foregrounding the fact that you as the instructor are uncomfortable with these things, but nevertheless, you know, feel obliged to teach them. And that class, race, gender are, are part of literature. They're an inherent part. We, you know, we, we don't need to just look at, you know, the ugly word theme. I mean, we've got so many more interesting things to look at. Um, so I think you need to balance your syllabus too, so that the students will get a sense of a variety of voices. You know, Toni Morrison is a perfect example. I mean, Song of Solomon is a, a great book. It's beautifully lyrical. It's complex. Um, so you take, I would take Ben Tender, 
and Song of Solomon and say something like, well, you know, how do these books treat the death of African Americans? Morrison's text begins with the suicide and ends in a very ambiguous way. We've got Jules Peterson and, and his death. And so, you know, I think there are ways to negotiate, um, you know, the kind of like, or complicate the issues of, of race in the text. Then the other thing I have to say um, is kind of specific about one particular uh, word that Fitzgerald uses, very controversial, and that's the, the Queensboro Bridge two bucks. Now I've always found this word puzzling because it seems to me intuitively that this is a bit of an anomaly for Fitzgerald. I work a little bit with his word hoax that we see um, in uh, um, Gatsby and reference to Tom Buchanan. And I've charted where the word hoax appears in his work throughout his canon. So I thought it wouldn't take long given you know, today's, stuff, uh, today's technology to do this with, with bucks. This, I went through Paradise, Flappers and Philosophers, Beautiful and Damned, Jazz Age, Gatsby and Tender. And he only uses the word one other time. And this is, where he's, this, is, this is what he says. It's in Beautiful and Damned. And it's, it's Richard Caramel, who's the writer, remember. Um, he writes The Demon Lover uh, after uh, Coleridge's Kublai Khan. And he says, quote, I get a thing I call sentence fever that must be like buck fever. It's a sort of intense literary self-consciousness. So that tells us a few things about how Fitzgerald is using the word in Gatsby. First of all, it's highly sexualized. Um, secondly, the explanation that we get here from Dick Caramel seems to suggest um, that writing fever like buck fever is some kind of compulsive frenzy. And that seems to go with how Fitzgerald wrote Beautiful and the Damned. He wrote it in about six months. Um, then the issue of you know some intense literary self-consciousness throws me for a loop, frankly. You know, I think here that uh, Caramel is is uh, Fitzgerald in disguise talking about his own writing. But one of the things that tells us is that there's a sense of power that Fitzgerald both is afraid of and wants to appropriate um, in the two bucks and let's not forget, and a girl. Um, it makes it very interesting. It almost seems on the one hand as if this power is through Dick Caramel, a writer's power. But it also seems in Gatsby that this is a sexualized um, power for, given to African-Americans and both maybe bedazzles and threatens Fitzgerald. Uh, so that's my little two cents. Hmm. Well, that, would, that would fit into much wider issues about um, Western European appropriation of the you know, primitive and Asian and, and African cultures throughout modernism too. Um, we, we're talking a bit here about the idea of Fitzgerald deflecting actually quite in a few different ways. Uh, and I wonder if we may turn to, to Deborah now about the, how, how that fits in with the Irishness in his work too. You've written a really important essay for the Fitzgerald Review um, uh, uh, on Fitzgerald Trickster, you, you called it. Uh, I wonder if you might uh, talk a little bit about that in terms of context as well as, as the texts themselves. Uh, yes, and what people have said about, you know, him letting one race stand in for another, I think is really, really pertinent here. And the fact that, I think it was said on Sunday, well, I don't see much about Irishness in his works, but I think there's much more than meets the eye for us now, because we don't notice Irishness like people would have in, in 1920 or 1925. Right. We don't maybe notice Irish surnames, for instance, uh, that are there uh, that would have been very noticeable to the original audiences. I wanted to go back and do a little bit about, uh, do a little bit about the prevalent I attitudes toward Irish immigrants uh, in Fitzgerald's time, especially. As we probably all know, 
the 40, 19, 1845 potato blight in Ireland had brought a huge wave of Irish immigrants to this country at that time. And, you know, you had um, about a half a million Irish immigrating to the U.S. in the, from, in a five-year period there, right after the uh, 1845, and almost one half of immigrants to the U.S. in 1840s were Irish, and they were vilified at, at that time. Now, you know, we're talking about some years before Fitzgerald's birth. Um, by his time, you know, the number of Irish immigrants, we'd moved on to other immigrants to vilify, in this country and the uh, Irish immigration had slowed to a relative tri triple. Right before his birth, it was around 50,000 50, per year, uh, for instance. And, but as we know that as the Irish assimilated and they were very big on the assimilation project as a rule, um, the harshness with which they were greeted really receded. But by Fitzgerald's time, there was still condescension and a veiled vestige of negativity toward Irish immigrants. And that's the point I want to make is that it wasn't all gone by his time. You know, it wasn't that uh, he wasn't recognized as Irish. Um, he was, and he, he and others experienced still this sort of in-betweenness that we see in Fitzgerald in so many ways. Uh, feeling in between because they were really vilified. They were kind of assimilated, but there were still these vestiges of attitudes toward the Irish. Uh, so for instance, Kenneth Roberts, uh, he was a writer who wrote a series of very virulently anti-immigration pieces for the Saturday Evening Post around this time in the um, teens and early 20s. One of his pieces in 1920 was called The Rising Irish Tide. <laughs> and of course, if you have are familiar with Stoddard's The Rising Tide of Color, you know where his title, The Rising Irish Tide, came from. And so there was still some concern there um, about the Irish. Uh, by the way, that appeared in, in the post on February 14th. 1920, just one week before the appearance of Fitzgerald's first story in the Post, Head and Shoulders, which is an interesting juxtaposition there. Um, Edmund Wilson, Fitzgerald's friend, friend, I'll put in quotes, it's a very complicated relationship. In 1922, uh, his Bookman article on Fitzgerald called F. Scott Fitzgerald, names being Irish is a key influence on Fitzgerald. That and being Midwestern are the two influences that got into the published piece. Um, and he catalogs a lot of traits that um, were the stereotypes of the Irish of a slightly earlier time. They're still there. Uh, being irrational and instead romantic. Uh, there's lots of little metaphorical references to being drunk uh, and that on and on. Uh, it, it originally included a lot more about Fitzgerald as, um, as the uh, heavy drinker. Mm -hmm. He wanted to name, he had it in the draft, the third influence on Fitzgerald was being alcoholic. But Fitzgerald got him to leave that part out. Um, but he still got a lot of veiled references in there. Um, so this reminds me of the um, kind of, oh, he also makes Fitzgerald, this is an Irish, this is not an Irish image, Ar uh, talks of him as a Harlequin figure, and which is reminiscent then of um, Fitzgerald's own use of that trademark with the black white face that Michael talked about the other day. Um, so there's that, which is a sign to us of what was going on for the Irish Americans at, in the 20s still. Henry Cabot Lodge in the 1890s had written explicitly that the Irish were inferior, but by 1910 to 1920, he was calling them, quote, honorary Anglo-Saxons. But notice the, you know, you're in, but you're not quite in kind of language still. Um, now, in St. Paul, where Fitzgerald grew up, one of the main places he grew up and was born, uh, it was known as an Irish town. You had uh, uh, 
the Irish, even though they weren't in great numbers, are about four to eight percent of the population of St. Paul at this time of uh, Fitzgerald's childhood, but they had attained some power in in uh, St. Paul. Um, there were no Irish wards, and they didn't get in. They weren't in certain neighborhoods, but kind of sprinkled out amongst uh, the different neighborhoods in St. Paul, which is important because um, they were more integrated into uh, St. Paul in general. Uh, mostly in, coming to the Midwest, the Irish immigrants like Fitzgerald's grandfather, Philip McQuillan, um, had spent some time in the U.S. first and obtained some capital before they came to St. Paul, and therefore they had uh, were in a position to become more successful financially because they weren't starting from scratch. He had been in the U.S. for um, 10 years before showing up in St. Paul to found his um, wholesale grocery, grocery store that, uh, or grocery business that uh, made him rich. Um, but of course, what gets involved here is religion because to say Irish was to say Irish Catholic as far as Irish immigrants were concerned. Uh, Protestants were still, there's a vestige of, though, of looking down on uh, Catholics, even though Catholic Catholicism was prominent and Irish Catholicism was prominent in St. Paul. Uh, the French Catholics who were earlier than the Irish Catholics in St. Paul were uh, considered the more elite, for instance. So it's, it's complicated. Um, James J. Hill in Fitzgerald's childhood was a St. Paul Summit Avenue residence. resident. His Irish immigrant wife, Mary Mahegan, uh, had, had he and her, he and she had to be courted by most everybody in town because they were beholden to Hill in one way or another, whether they worked for him or did business with him or whatever it was. Uh, and um, so that was significant in kind of keeping whatever anti-Irish sentiments there were kind of mostly under wraps. Uh, and I, by the way, I want to recommend the book. This is a wonderful um, book called Claiming the City. Politics, Faith, and the Power of Place in St. Paul by Mary Leithert Wingard. It's from about 20 years ago now, uh, but it is really wonderful for understanding the backdrop of Fitzgerald and St. Paul and Irish Catholicism and all of this that I'm talking about. Um, in 1925, Fitzgerald's uh, fellow St. Paul um, author, Grace Flando, was to say in an article on St. Paul, she was to speak of quote, the immigrant class of soft-speaking, darling, shiftless Irish from Galway, end of quote, that were in St. Paul. So that's another thing where, oh, aren't they cute? It's sort of a, um, we're fond of them kind of attitude toward the Irish immigrants in St. Paul, but it, a lot of condescension there. Uh, then I also want to quote Fitzgerald's The Scandal Detectives, one of his um, stories from the late 1920s about uh, one of his Basil stories. Uh, he says, quote, in sordid poverty below the bluff 200 feet away lived the mix. They had merely inherited the name for they were now largely of Scandinavian descent. And when other amusements palled, a few cries were enough to bring a gang of them swarming up the hill to be faced, if numbers promised well, to be fled from into convenient houses if things went the other way. So you can see kind of a melding of the concerns about race and class there. The, the mix, the Irish are not really Irish, they're Scandinavian now. Whoever racially is in the position of being considered the lowest on the lowest rung, is coming up from the lower town. St. Paul's built on a bunch of hills, up in Summit Hill to, um, to interact, <laughs> to fight with um, Basil and his friends, his kind of uh, elite friends up on in the Summit Avenue area of St. Paul. So uh, it's kind of interesting. And remember, Basil is half Irish himself. His mother's name was Alex Riley. So, but he's 
he's considers himself somewhat in a different position. Uh, and Fitzgerald was ashamed of his uh, lowly Irish Catholic immigrant status. His forebears, the McQuillans on the maternal side, he felt were lowly. Uh, you can see that the kind of positionality in the St. Scandal Detectives passage. And, um, you know, uh, so that's how, that's basically how he felt about his Irish ethnicity when he got to prep school and met uh, Sean Leslie and uh, Father uh, Monsignor Darcy. I always want to call him, now it's Monsignor Faye. I always get his fictional ca counterpart and his names confused with each other. Um, he gained a little more appreciation for a while at least of a more uh, elite Irish culture and background that, that they talked about. But I think the childhood imagery kind of held on to him as well. Um, what's really interesting, though, going back to that Wilson article about Fitzgerald's attitude is when Fitzgerald was presented with the draft of that essay that appeared in Bookman that was so negative about Irishness and so on, he um, he's told Wilson, gee, that's a wonderful article. <laughs> he said, uh, it's the only intelligible and intelligent thing of any language think that has been written about me and my stuff. He did ask them to leave out the liquor part. So he said, that'll hurt me more than you can imagine. My in-laws are going to be mad at me. It's going to hurt me professionally also. Uh, but he, I always take this though, that it wasn't necessarily that he really agreed. He was kind of buttering Wilson up. He didn't want this thing to go south. He didn't want it not to appear. It was very important to him professionally. This is going to be one of the first articles about him, or really the first, in such a esteemed place as Bookman, which was an important, uh, important place to be at that point. So, you know, I think that we, it is interesting, but we have to take it kind of with a grain of salt in some sense. Um, anyway, I, I think, to, yeah. I just wonder we might uh, think about those ideas about, um, the kind of high, a hierarchy of of otherness <laughs> in a sense, right? Uh, but also, um, I think we'll pick up on this maybe, um, Catherine, especially about um, drunkenness and liquidity. I think uh, comes into yeah. play when we think about the novel. So I wonder if we might move on a little bit here now, just to interest of time to uh, sure. think about now the the beautiful and damned in more in more depth, and um, then on ten tenders the night afterwards. Um, so we have a, a different take, I think. Uh, we're thinking a lot about anti-Semitism and, and um, um, color and blackness, right, race in this, this text. But one thing that we want to pick up on too, David, is the ideas of uh, Asian and Asian Americans in The Beautiful and Damned. Um, and I wonder if you might uh, just lead us into some Insights, and it was a, a real insight for me too. What you what you wrote about Tana, the character, the Japanese uh, servant character in *The Beautiful and Damned*. Uh, sure, <clears throat> I'd be I'd be glad to. Um, so yeah, I I think that one of the reasons I'm I'm on the panel is because I wrote um, a section on uh, Tana Lahaka or Tana. Um, who is the, uh, the domestic help for the Fitzgeralds. And my interest in Tana led me down a number of rabbit holes. And one of them um, is the, the, the Japanese diaspora, so to speak, um, from Japan to Hawaii, the West Coast and the East Coast. And so um, I'm gonna, quickly, but I'm going to inflict a little bit of this on the audience um, as a context to um, Tana Lahaka's character. So this will probably take me about three minutes to read. Um, and if it takes more than that, uh, Bill just cut me off and I'll get to Tana himself. Um, the Japanese use the term, it's spelled I-S-S-E-I, -S -S -E um, pronounced Issei, to denote a first generation immigrant and Nikkei or Nisei um, for the second generation descendants. The first Japanese come to New York City in 1860. 
They were the Japanese bakufu um, or the, the shogunate for that particular time. In 1868, just a few years later, they had a civil war and a new um, uh, generation, a more progressive generation kind of comes to power in the, the Meiji dynasty. So an important um, point would be the oceanic group um, named after the boat, not some kind of conspiratorial thing. The oceanic group is comprised of six businessmen who come to New York in 1876. And that's typically when the beginning of Japanese on the East Coast um, is, is given, is that year. Uh, this book here, um, the subtitle reads, Japanese American Community in New York City, 1876 to the 1930s. Um, so we really begin this in 1876. Considered broadly, the Japanese who emigrated from Japan to New York City and the East Coast were of a higher social class than the Japanese who immigrated to Hawaii and the West Coast. Those who came to New York were from urban, not rural areas, as were most of the Japanese who settled on the West Coast and in Hawaii. They also had more formal education, emigrated as individuals as opposed to families, as did many, not all of course, but many on the, on the West Coast. They were almost exclusively male, about 90% as of 1920. They did not do, the immigrants now, the EC on the East Coast, they did not do physical labor. They did not do manual labor at all, it was beneath them. They were on average older, between 30 and 40 than the West Coast counterparts. And the elite class that comes to New York City, as you, you know, and I'm thinking this is like maybe 5% at the most um, of these immigrants were students, uh, diplomats, and commercial businessmen. And many of them got, were, were millionaires seven times, oh, several times over. Now, many of these elite, not many of the um, typical Issei on the, on the East Coast. An important thing is that the East Coast Japanese immigrants had a very different cultural experience than their counterparts. They experienced, although they did in, experience individual racism, um, they did not experience systematic racism uh, from the press. And this isn't because the East Coast is more enlightened than the West Coast. It's simply that there are not that many um, Japanese Issei, Japanese immigrants in the area. In 1920, there's about 4,600. The statistics vary, the number. There's about 4,600 um, Issei in and around New York City compared to about and again, the statistics vary. I've got various you know, figures. Around 215,000, about 60,000 men, 50,000 women, and 5,000 children just in Hawaii. That's 215,000, and at least 100,000 on the West Coast in Oregon, Washington, and mostly in California. These East Coast immigrants have a particular kind of visa called a Ki-Imin visa, designated non-laborers. And the vast majority of the West Coast immigrants have the Imin passport specifying that they're, they're workers, they're laborers. Uh, Dave, is this a good time to, to shift then? Because we're talking, I suppose, here about you know, in some ways, the, the modernization of Japan in the late 19th, early 20th century, right? A really a fo focused national program. And then how does Tonga fit into to this picture then? Right, and that was exactly the last paragraph here. Here's how <laughs> right. Tonga fits in. Um, he conforms to these in the sense that he's single, he's older, and he's a male who's employed as a domestic for the Fitzgeralds. And again, despite all the education, et cetera, about 70% of these 4,600 or so Japanese Issei, about 70% work as domestics. The rest work as cooks, 
and in the shipyards, Brooklyn shipyard until they're, um, uh, till they can't work there anymore from legislation. You want me to get to Tana now? Um, I, yeah, I mean, I, I was, I was uh, reading some of the reviews of, of the novel recently, and I think it's three, two or three times, there's this, you know, there's a slur, they, there's just dismissive of him. He's a comic character, according to the reviewers. They call him a Jap, uh, just, you know, just ca kind of casual slur there as if that's okay to put in a national newspaper or magazine. Um, and you're arguing, aren't you, that there's so much more to this character than a yes, comic. Sure, I can, I can speak to that. For, I think Jap as a term is a, originates about 1880 and on the West Coast. Um, yeah, I find Tana, I guess one way of saying this simply is he's kind of portrayed, I think, as the idiot savant in the text. Um, he is, to me, in my reading, and I, I, I'm happy to share it and talk about it, um, he's the creative force in the text. He's a sense of professionalism in the text. And especially, he's the artist trying to express himself in the text. Um, Tandalahaka, his name is not a possibility in Japanese. They don't have L's, they don't have LA's, and they don't have surnames that are more than four syllables long. Um, he's given to us at first as conscientious, as efficient, as faithful. Um, and in a, in a novel where Anthony never works, you know, Tana works. Not only does he work, he performs, which is very crucial to me. He plays the flute and he plays the flute with some effort. It's not like the flute comes naturally to him, although I think, well, it's not, it's portrayed as if the flute doesn't come naturally to him. He's got to practice. Um, and I think a lot of the misconceptions about Tana are, are due to the narrator. I think the narrator in this text is the villain. He's the antagonist. Um, there's no reason in the world that um, Blockman has to say to Gloria uh, after her, after her uh, scream, scream test that there's a part for her as a very haughty widow. There's just, you know, this just isn't Blockman's job, as he says, is to take care of the actors and actresses. Uh, there's no reason that, that um, toward the end of the text, when Fitzgerald has Anthony say disparaging things to Blockman, all of a sudden on page 360, the narrator imposes that Blockman has actually taken, you know, has, has taken sparring lessons. You know, so not only is, is there a negative, but he's gonna make sure that he beats the crap out of him. So I think the narrator here is, is, is very, very problematic. And I think his representation of Tana is very problematic. I just want to jump in really quickly because I'm, I'm totally on board anytime we question a Fitzgerald narrator and recognize the ironic gap. But I actually think that uh, part of what you're tapping into here that's so important to get out of Fitzgerald's work is that the comic stereotype is there in Tana. And yet, because of this kind of Orientalist view of Tana, he can also stand in for things that for Fitzgerald are very positive, like sensuousness and eros and artistry and mysterious Japanese flute. This doesn't make that idiom non-racist or not orientalist, but it does indicate how much of these ideas about race are predicated on desire not just disgust, not just um, a caricature that's hostile. Like this is actually in some ways um, a facilitating fiction for Fitzgerald, this identification with his Orientalist projection of what this manservant is like. I, I would certainly, you know, agree with that. I'd, I'd, I'd have two quick things to say and, um, you know, I'm willing to stop at any time. The, the first thing is that um, Fitzgerald may have, um, and I don't think we're gonna have time for the slides, but in one of the slides, um, I've got a, a triangle club, um, 1913, 1914 production called In Pursuit of Priscilla, 
which is done in, in yellow phase. Now that's Fitzgerald's first year at Princeton and you know of his ambitions to be in the Triangle Club. <clears throat> and there's a sense that the model for Tana may have its vestiges or may have its first kernel, let's say, um, in Fitzgerald seeing or hearing about the pursuit of Priscilla. The next thing I have to say is much more controversial, I think. Um, and, and I just want to present this as a, a kind of a thought. Um, so he's writing The Beautiful and the Damned, and it's, it's, it's 124,000 words. He writes it in six months. He's writing at a pretty good clip. Now, how is he going to produ produce in, in direct quotes, in direct quotes now, in actual speech act, how is he going to represent Tana? I mean, can he normalize Tana's language and make it standard English? I don't think so. Mm. So I so think he's in, a, he's in a real bind here as to how to represent Tana. And one more thing quickly, and I find a lot of the times when Tana is speaking kind of funny because Fitzgerald is overly meticulous about grammar. He's using semicolons and colons and periods and direct quotes all in the same seven words. But on the other hand, what recourse does he have? Given the sense of um, verisimilitude um, he's and and with his narrator, so I'm not sure how speaking at it from the perspective of the writer, how else he would choose or select to represent Tana, except given Tana's actual language, which I have um, in the slides an example of. Yeah, you pick you pick up an important point, which runs you know, right right through, doesn't it? The American lit of this period. How, how does Willa Cather represent? Um, Certain dialect, etc. Right. Um, I, I just want to say something too about the um, just to kind of step back a little bit from where Tana might fit into the text. I, I think also he's once you see how the seriousness of what he does and the effort that's involved, um, it strikes me that that you know, he is there in large measure to show the childishness, the the, the uselessness of the main characters. Uh, of of Patch and and, and Gloria, um, and the other thing is that this is all, fits really well with what Arnold Rampersand was saying too about the about Gatsby. That when we think about the focus of it, it's an indictment of the dominant U.S. culture, and I think that's what's happening in Beautiful and Damned here too. I want to turn to to Meredith because she has something else to say about the Beautiful and Damned uh, related, but quite different, I think. I, I do, but I, I think I just kind of want to touch on this point before I move on. It's very interesting, these characters who have this kind of like relentless productivity, you know, that, you know, Tana, like he's working, he's supporting himself, he's a tailor, you know, he plays the flute. Um, Blackman, you know, he's like brought his, you know, he's he's pulled himself up, he's become this like boxer, he's physical, so he transcends the anti-Semitic stereotype of the feminized Jew, and Gatsby, who's like working, working, working constantly, you know, in order to win back Daisy. So I do think these characters who are so sort of relentlessly productive are a critique of this like indolent class that's so embodied in, you know, Anthony and Gloria. Um, I also want to say one quick thing about the Irish piece and then a few more words about the beautiful and damned, if I may. Mm -hmm. Like, sure, I was so struck by Rob Prasad's comment about the sort of Irish energy in Fitzgerald. And I wondered immediately, like if Fitzgerald was reading Yeats, like what he would have known about the Easter Rising, like what people were talking about at Princeton and you know, among intellectuals about Irish radicalism at that time. And it did make me think that there's a kind of post or anti-colonial energy in Gatsby mm -hmm. in particular. Um, that like, and in other texts as well, that we might want to think about. And I was looking at the passage that Deborah cited in her article. And that last line is like, I spent my youth alternately crawling in front of the kitchen maids and insulting the great, you know? Right. And like, that was just, that just resonated for me, you know, like hugely after that discussion, like how much is Gatsby a novel about insulting the great, you know? Um, and how much do we see that coursing throughout Fitzgerald's work? 
Um, but to go back to Beautiful and Damned, David, your reading of Tana really opened things up for me and made me think like, we can't, this is the interesting thing about Fitzgerald. He's never doing just one thing. No, you're like, right. He's always like using the stereotype and subverting the stereotype and complementing and complicating the stereotype. And I honestly think what he does is a kind of sampling. I don't think we have to worry about whether or not he read things like James Alden Johnson or what we would have, what he would have known about, you know, the Japanese in New York, because I think he just, I think the way that he read, we know, like, just like his wide range of engagements. And I think he just really took things in. I think there's a level of absorption and reprocessing, you know, that I seems to have I gone on. Agree. I completely agree. Um, well, one more quick thing about Tana is, in some ways, he doesn't have to be in this text. He really doesn't. We've got Gloria, we've got Anthony, we've got Caramel, we've got Maury, we've got Blockman, we've got Dot. Fitzgerald puts him in because he's living with Tana at the time he's writing. Right, right. That's why, that's why Tana's in the text. But, but he, he doesn't was... have to be in this text. He's there, as Bill was saying, in part, to show us that these other people, and remember, Tana probably is about 35, that these other people are children. Mm -hmm. Let's, uh, I think we, we need to go down to tenders and I too, but Meredith, I'm sorry, I'd, I'd like to have heard more a little bit about the uh, First World War and, and I, Dot. I would, but, love, I would have loved to say more, but that's okay. I know we need to talk <laughs> about that tonight. I would, I would if, I, if, if I could add just one more thing about the beautiful and damned, is that okay? Uh, quickly, yeah, because I mean, we want to uh, do some time on tender I, too. I, I just want to mention Geraldine Burke, the, the, uh, Irish, very Irish named uh, early girlfriend of uh, Anthony right about the time he's meeting um, Gloria. And I, I find that's another character maybe you wouldn't have to be there, but it's very important. And it is she who hears the story about the Irish Chevalier O'Keefe. Right. It's interesting. So I won't say any more because I know we have to go on, but I, uh, you know, there you have the, the Irishness and the the class distinctions because she is not of the proper class to be a you know to be a Laurie Gilbert for him and for Anthony and uh, and he points that out in the story about the peasant girl. Okay, well uh, there'll be um, a lot to read in about um, 12, 15 months' time in this new collection. Um, Catherine, can we turn to you with uh, some? key thoughts about the way that you approached Tenders a Night. Oh, you're on mute, Catherine. I just realized. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Tender as the Night is a fascinating text viewed through the lens of race in Fitzgerald. Um, Fitzgerald both writes sumptuously about the south of France and then Dick Diver experiences the incursion of all manner of black immigrants from the diaspora as a kind of phobic experience as several critics have written about, about very beautifully in the discovery of the black man in Rosemary's bed whose corpse needs to be taken away before this scandalizes everyone. Um, my work on Tender is the Night and Race draws upon popular eugenics from the early 20th century, which again, as Meredith was saying, was sort of in the air. And in particular, climatological racial theory was of great interest both to Fitz and to Zelda. They would write to each other about southernness and its effects on the body, its effects on the temperament. And this question of southernness was never far from a question of race. Right. And eugenics was hand in hand with what was called its sister science, eugenics. So this question of um, dietary purity and either racial degeneration or the protection of whiteness. So in my chapter on Tender as the Night, I argue that the novel is preoccupied with white women, both as something to be protected, like Rosemary's white flesh, 
at the very beginning of the novel where all the other expatriate women, not all of them, I'm exaggerating, but Mary North is in the water near her. And it's almost like this, this shark scene <laughs> that, that the young white girl is gonna be devoured. Um, but part of that anxiety, I argue, is an anxiety about racial contamination. Um, she, by the second half of the novel, is wearing these black pajamas, is drinking coffee, whereas Dick Diver is sort of sinking under the weight of his alcoholism, his constant coffee consumption can't get him to the same level of vibrancy and energy that Nicole and Rosemary share. So I'm particularly interested in that novel of how white women become troped as these consumers who can imbibe these tropical substances and they just energize them. But I think from the point of view of the novel that also is a potential contaminant and that becomes in the dream world of the text confused with sexualized issues of miscegenation. When Abe North dies and Mary North takes up with the man of the Hindu Berber strain, suddenly the fear, right, is that Topsy is gonna crawl and her name is Topsy, is gonna crawl in the bathtub with the dirty children. So there is a way in which the alimentary, what you consume, in a culinary way is overlaid with the erotic and the reproductive in that novel. And I think there's a fear that all of the Latin men who are sexy rather than um, immediately threatening like the specter of blackness in that novel, that the Latin men are gonna get the girls who are addicted to coffee and enjoying Southern wine anyway. And, and what's, what's absolutely brilliant to, about that chapter is, is just the detail that you include about colors and food and tastes and, uh, and, and smells and landscapes and climate. Um, my favorite is that kind of literary, uh, the literary textures of the trembling blancmange. <laughs> that's, that's great. I do, I do actually have um, a, a slight disagreement about how you're reading Tommy Barbin though. And, and that is, I, I do think that he's there also for, um, I always kind of see him as a hero in some ways of the text, not the barbarian, not the, he, he's, he's, he's involved in barbarity, like in the, the love scene in that, uh, that two-star hotel that he has with, with Nicole. But um, I think he's fragile too in different ways. And he's the only male survivor in that text. I really like that actually as, as a revision of my reading because I think if, if our auditors take one thing away about my feelings about how race plays out in Fitzgerald is that it always intermingles disgust and desire, identification and revulsion. Um, so it fits very well Fitzgerald's obsession with these liminal races that we would not today even consider racialized groups, but like the preoccupation with the, the Mediterranean race by Stoddard, by Grant, it's everywhere. Geographers of the time are writing that way. So Bill, I really, I think your point is well taken that Barbin can be this ambiguous character, unlike Nicotera, who I think is, is uh, unilaterally negative, that there's a kind of, allure of this masculinized Mediterranean muscular hardness. And of course, Dick Diver and his, his name even tropes this downward trajectory is a uh, feeling that he's lost control over his body. And one of the more extended arguments I make in the chapter is that these preoccupations with racial categories with a fear of contamination is really a discomfort with corporeality, right? It's really a discomfort with our porousness. This is one of the reasons I think that eating is a way that people think through race relations because whiteness is supposed to be hermetic, self-contained and pure and eating reveals how we're open to the world. So I really love your argument that that Tommy Barbon is not just the barbarian at the gate, but is also potentially a model for um, a racialized masculinity that might not be nightmarish, 
that might not be a straightforward threat. That's neat. Just I wonder how we, I was wondering how we, we combine this idea of the you know the you, you talk about the openness of of women in particular you know the the way that they can change um, you know physically and cult culturally but then how does that match in with the idea of um, the 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 males in some ways that are, that are um, feminized then is that is that why they fail because they don't retain that hardness. Um, I, I think that one of the um, problems for characters like Dick Diver, whose name is also quite phallic, is this um, holding on to this ideal of hard masculinity. Um, and also, I think it goes into a tragic Nordic narrative so that one way of understanding Dick Diver's alcoholism is as a symptom of stereotyped Irishness, right? That Fitzgerald keeps mentioning his Celticness throughout the text. But actually another way of construing that is that it's a sign that he's of a superior race. Uh, Madison Grant in particular talks about alcoholism as a Nordic vice. So what Deborah was bringing up earlier are the Irish you know, Celtic or are they honorary Nordic? And what does that mean for them? You could see Dick's dissolution as a sign of his um, purported, this is obviously in eugenics discourse of his racial superiority. So he can't survive, right? As he's feminized, as he's racialized, this is ruining the monument of Nordic manhood and he has to go to upstate New York to get colder and survive. Like women are just too sticky and too manipulative of their intoxicants. So I think um, that yes, the short answer is yes. Once men relinquish their hold on this hardness and purity and whiteness, um, then they have this tragic downfall. But I'd like to read against the grain. So what interests me about the novel is all of the appetites, all of the acknowledgements of bodies that share uh, wine that are sticky because of the humidity of the Mediterranean. And I don't think that reading against the grain is reading in a way that um, is completely missing what Fitzgerald is doing because he is so invested in describing these tastes, these atmospheres, like at the same time that the plot trajectory seems to be saying, and this is bad, don't follow Dick's example. Don't hook up with white women who are gonna hook up with Latin men. Uh, the plot is saying that, but the imagery is saying like how incredible that we're in this place that we are um, consumers of globalized goods there's a tension, I think, inside the work itself. A real, a real tension. And it does help us to see, I think, the way that Fitzgerald complicates race. And as Michael Nolan talked in the last seminar about the ambiguities, they're, they're all there if you see the, if you see the text in the well, form. And it seems to me that often his um, anxieties about oh. women become really closely tied to these racial sim symbols. So I really love that Meredith about your argument that Dot is associated with Africanism, what Toni Morrison mm -hmm. would call Africanism in the text mm -hmm. because of her Southerness. But this is a larger, this is a larger dynamic in Fitzgerald that because white women and this, also speaks to passing fiction within the Harlem Renaissance because white women can reproduce racial difference in these texts, they're always associated with racial difference. Like, like Daisy Buchanan, you know, Jordan saying all of us are white and then, you know, the pause. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, we, we need to, uh, I think I, I'm seeing Kirk's uh, shadow here uh, appropriately. Um, 
uh, Meredith, you want to come back on that just briefly about the southernness? And... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, this was, it, it, you know, writing this article kind of like let me kind of delve into, you know, Fitzgerald's attitudes towards southernness and the depiction of Anthony, you know, in the in the the camp in Alabama. Um, this was fast, this was just like, sort of a fascinating thing to explore. And I do think there's like that hint of miscegenation when you're, you know, he's first been with Gloria and he's involved with then with Dot, whose name kind of connotes a blemish or a stain. Gloria's from a border state. Daisy Buchanan's also from a border state, you know, worth worth thinking about, you know. So what the difference is when you're a white man of the North involved with a woman of the sort of like middle border South versus the deep South. Um, again, just like worth thinking about. I'm also very interested in the military imagery. And one of the things I was exploring is kind of a blur between the Civil War and World War I in the way that Anthony thinks about his military involvement and his kind of patch family legacy. And so one of the things I focused on quite a bit in Beautiful and the Damned is their visit to Arlington House, which is an interesting to do, thing to do on your honeymoon, you know, just... <laughs> <laughs> just like as a thing. Um, but I learned quite a bit about the way that the Lee mansion and grounds were kind of undergoing this rethinking. Um, you know, there'd been a Freedmen's um, settlement on that space. Obviously the cemetery is also on that space. You know, that's part of what Anthony and Gloria don't see. Um, what Gloria sees in particular is the civil war past, you know, that's being lost to her. And she's, and it's very, racialized and kind of animalized in the way she they depict it there's a lot of like like there's peanut shells there's banana peels um there's like like offensive scents you know um so there's just that sense of degradation and decay that's associated with the elementary um and my thinking about this was really triggered by what Kat talked about in her chapter and, and we have the connection between the the civil war southern lost cause with the kind mm -hmm. of Decline of the Nordics as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, very we, we see that in the Ice Palace, of course. I mean, um, you know, where there's the connection between the North and the South, the cemetery versus the Ice Palace, etc. Yeah, and and uh, that would um, lead us into short story discussions. Except, I I think uh, we we may have a few Q and A's. I'm hoping that. Um, that Kirk will, will come come back in here. I would love to have talked more about this uh, in terms of short stories. Um, thinking of the Southern stories, the Civil War st stories, Tender as a Night too, if you go back to the Civil War, we have Indian Wars, the Civil War, the First World War, we got a history of, of, of American conflict in relation to, to race. Um, yes, we'd love to have I think Kirk, we're going to have to have a, a bonus uh, webinar on short stories with Bernice Bobs or Hair, Diamond, Benjamin Button, Dice Bracks, Knuckles and Guitar, The Sensible Thing, and The Hotel Child. I think what it demonstrates, and again, I can't figure out how to get my face back on here, but that's all right. Um, yeah. Oh, am I? Okay. Um, it demonstrates how much work we have left to do and how we've really only begun to scratch the surface. And I think that, uh, you know, again, I would invite folks that are interested in this subject to really uh, dig around beyond Gatsby because there is a lot left to say in, the, in, in what I think unfortunately are often sort of considered the tangential, tangential texts. Uh, Bryant Mangum last week mentioned Dearly Beloved, which was his late effort to create a sort of African-American monologue, um, which is a, a fascinating piece to, to, read, to read. And it's, it's really never gotten any attention at all. So uh, just a sign of what there is to do. Very quickly, if uh, I was gonna go ahead and run through David's uh, slides, if I can find them here. Um, sorry, let me. Yeah, I would, I'd just like to interrupt quickly and say how, how pleasurable and informative it was to read um, Deborah's article and, and the chapters by Kat and uh, Meredith. I thought that, um, you know, that it was just really, really important and, and fun and also inspiring to read these. We don't have to go through all of these. We can just skip this one. I just wanted to, yeah, let's go here. So. <laughs> There we are. That's that's the first. Um, this is Mr. 
Coy. Um, his class is 1873. He seems to be the first uh, Japanese American who's, who's been graduated. I would say just quickly, you can see that he's very dapper. He's very, the, the pose is very self-confident. Um, he seems pretty fully integrated. Next slide. This is the first PhD um, that Princeton issues to Japanese 1904 in economics. Next slide. The fellow on the far left here, Mr. <laughs> Huang, he is a Chinese, but importantly, he's on the Daily Princeton. He's on the editorial staff of the Daily Princeton. I think this is 1913, 1915. So again, uh, there's a sense that the elite Japanese, the elite Issei, um, do have prominence at Princeton. This is a prominent position. Next slide. This is a very interesting photo. We again have two Chinese uh, here. They're front and center, left and right. Um, they seem to be, you know, they're clearly accepted by their eating club. On the other hand, they do happen to be positioned lower than all the white people. Um, so it's a very ambiguous kind of slide that both, I think, integrates uh, in an unashamed way uh, Asians, but also subtly gives them little tiny chairs to sit on. Next slide, please. Um, oh, we don't have to do this. It's just, as, yeah, there we go. Um, here's some minstrelese. Um, this is from uh, the eight, 1899, 1889 um, bric-a-brac. And the point here, of course, is to see how prevalent minstrelese was. There's a whole club devoted just to minstrelese. Next slide. Um, again, examples of black face and yellow face. Um, uh, up at the top here, you can see the, um, the, the Chinese lanterns above the umbrella. Uh, next slide. This is very important. I mentioned this before, the pursuit of Priscilla. Um, this, um, the commentary here, these are all things that I've garnered from the scouring through the um, Silimad archives. Um, I'm pretty sure that, that Fitzgerald saw this, um, or if he didn't see it, he certainly heard about it, was influenced by it. When Tana is wrapped in the comforter or kimono, I, I think that you know he gets um, some of his representation of Tana through this. Next slide. Um, there is Tana's, um, it's, uh, here we have up at the top, um, right from beautiful and damn Japanese reliable employment agency, and there it is on the, on the left there. Um, and there's the contract. Um, and um, he even has written in Fitzgerald's handwriting, Lieutenant Emil Tannenbaum, uh, German intelligence officer, and then Kelly, which I presume is their cat. Next slide. That's Tana, a uh, blow up of the picture. And I think that it's, it's, it's far more likely that Fitzgerald's patronized Tana, uh, making him out to be a household curiosity, many Japanese, uh, were seen as um, uh, curiosities, not as threats as they were on the West Coast. Uh, next slide. Yeah, this is just um, examples of Tana's um, broken English. And if we want to say, you know, his, his representation is a kind of quasi-minstrel figure. Um, but also the next slide, very important that Tana and Anthony drink together. And then on the bottom, uh, when um, Anthony is so upset with Gloria for going um, all over New York State with Blockman, he says, you know, he's, he's using Tana's language in, in a fit of, you know, anger when his rationality, so to speak, is, is less. He, he's adopting Tana's language himself. Uh, next slide. Yeah, this, we don't, you know, this is just all of the information that he does when he's talking about the, the typewriter um, episode, which is very important to my reading. Next slide. Um, this we don't really have to do. It's just talking about the flute in, per, in, in particular. Um, I've, I've gone through all the Fitzgerald texts I can, right from the beginning, I'll show Pirate and May Day. Next slide. To the end, one trip abroad, um, the person who is playing the flute is always, always given to us as a kind of a grotesque, as a comedian, uh, burlesquing the, um, the 
Uled Niles, as, as I've heard many pronunciations, but Uled Niles seems to be the um, one that occurs most frequently. So in every instance, in every single instance of the flute player in Fitzgerald's canon, um, the flute player is always given to us as performing, as, contort as being contorted by his efforts to play the flute. Done, thank you very much. All right. Oh yeah, the, the, I, this is just um, where I got my information. All right. Great, thank you. Um, there's a lot of questions about representation in the society and uh, trust me, we are very sensitive to that and we do do as much outreach as we can. And, uh, you know, we certainly uh, would, would love to have more of a diverse society. I think part of, I'm very hesitant to say this, but I think part of what happens is there are maybe more opportunities in uh, other, other fields right at the moment is the perception. One of the things author study struggles with is, uh, 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 Meredith, I see nodding her head, so thank you. Uh, the sense that, that we are too invested in kind of a hero worship or a bio, biographical, um, however you want to say it, sort of a, sort of a support. And uh, that maybe for a long time did not invite um, non-Caucasian folks to, to, to be a part of things. But I do think part of it is there's just a lot more opportunities right now in, in African-American lit and in, in other, in other um, you know, areas of literature. We, we are always going to fight, I think, in Fitzgerald society, the perception that we may be a little, as an author society, a little antiquated. But uh, we would certainly be open to, you know, any discussion, whatever we could. And we do try to do outreach. I do uh, want to assure folks of that. Um, any, if any of our other commenters would like to Give us a closing word of wisdom or two before we throw it back to Bill. I don't, I don't see how people could, could read the three essays and think that we're antiquated. Um, I, I think all of them um, speak to our concerns, um, uh, our contemporary concerns and in contemporary language. Uh, yeah. And there's a point made in about the new novel, The Chosen and Beautiful, uh, and I'm hoping that that gets talked about uh, uh, on Sunday in the teaching, because that strikes me as a perfect example of a way that we can use um, a, a more multiracial approach to Gatsby to, uh, to, to, to bring in the conversation. Go ahead, Meredith. Yeah, um, you know, I was thinking back to um, Robert Schott's talk and, you know, like in my own writing on Fitzgerald, I'm always teaching him in the context, you know, of the African American um, and Jewish American and other ethnic representations of the period. And I think that that's part of how Fitzgerald needs needs to be taught, you know, in order to bring in, you know, more students of color, you know, if we think, I, I mean, I'm thinking in my own field, like in Wharton studies, you know, this is, I mean, this is an issue in, in my field too, whenever you're studying a white canonical author, you know, you need to make very clear the way in which that author's work is is like opened up. And I think the great thing about Fitzgerald is like we're demonstrating, you know, the way in which his work is is opened up. But we need to keep demonstrating that, like in the classroom, you know, as well as in scholarship. And I'm also just thinking back to Fitzgerald to uh, Rompersad's comments, like we, we, you know, he's sort of viewing Fitzgerald as an idol smasher, you know, who's really speaking back to the dominant culture. And I think that we can just kind of continue to think about like the, the amazing things that he's doing in that way in his, in, in his sort of imaginative struggle, you know, that Kat is talking about, you know, um, whether it fits with like the dominant narrative of the text is another question, but I think that that's exactly what makes it, um, these novels really interesting to teach and study. I just want to say on a personal note, having read and edited everybody here but Kat, but having read her book, um, it is very exciting just to sort of pop open a chapter or a entire book and, and really realize how as familiar I think I am with these works, the way that the, 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 each of yours writing really makes me see the text differently. 
and new. So I want to thank you all for your uh, contributions to Fitzgerald studies. And I know I speak for the audience when I, when I say we um, can't wait for the beautiful and damn book, but Deborah's article is available. It's in 2016 issue, I believe. And Kat's book is, um, is, is available as well. It's, and very easily be uh, downloadable through Kindle for, for a decent price for, for a book from a university press, I might add. So Bill, I'm going to toss it to you and let you uh, wrap it up. I just want to remind people that we will be back with the teaching Gatsby panel on Sunday afternoon at 4 p.m. Eastern. And then Wednesday, June 30th uh, at 1 p.m. We'll be talking, I imagine we'll be talking these issues again because we're going to talk about teaching Fitzgerald around the world. Well, I'll, I'll just close very simply, everyone, that um, we all bring our, our own personal and um, historical and um, ethnic and racial biases to whatever we do. But we try to, like a, an author like Fitzgerald, uh, also confront them while we're writing, uh, too. And I think that's something we have to always, always remember. And it's the job of critics to try to tease out the controversies as, as well as the, you know, the great things about, about his work. And I, I, was, um, I was pleased to see, to see Catherine's um, quotation from Tender's Night. Uh, I, I missed this before. Description of Nicole's hair, Chow's hair foaming and frothing in the candlelight. <laughs> uh, but to actually make use of a, 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 a passage like that and, and show how it is so layered and how we understand Fitzgerald through race and sexuality and, um, and gen gender and class. So I thank all of our panelists today for coming on board uh, to Meredith Goldsmith, Catherine Kaiser, Deborah Schlax, and David Ulrich. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing everyone at the next session of our summer school. Great. Thank you. Thank you all very Thank you. much. Bye-bye. <laughs>